a lot of the EQ literature is talking about being a good listener, you know, practicing empathy. So listening is great, but if you've never been lied to in life, congratulations. And I already said earlier, people lie to themselves. So the words are, are wonderful, but sometimes people don't say everything that's on their mind. Sometimes they're not as articulate as they might be. Sometimes they don't actually realize how they're feeling or what the important clues are. So in ambiguous situations, the literature suggests that about 55% of the true communication is coming from the face. That was Dan Hill, and you're listening to episode 178 of the Building Psychological Strength podcast, where we uncover the information, tools, and techniques to turn our mind into our most valuable asset. The courage to face fears with persistence. Being able to be present enough in this moment to choose my response thoughtfully. We have the strength to bend to life stressors, to bend to adversity without snapping, without breaking. There are only six things that contribute to our quality of life, and they are all experiences. In every moment, we are deciding who we want to be and how we want to live our lives. Noticing what your brain is doing and then being able to make choices. Mobilize the things that we know lift us up. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Building Psychological Strength Podcast. My name is April and I'm your host. I wanna thank you so much for coming back week after week after week. It absolutely warms my heart, especially in the times that are as uncertain and crazy as these last couple of months have been. It has been such an anchor point in my life to be able to do this podcast and connect even in this virtual audio way with so many of you who I feel like are truly this family and community that's forming. So I just want to thank you for continuing to come back here because again, this anchor point in my life of putting together these episodes and finding experts and diving into their areas of expertise has been something that has been just a motivator for me during a time when it would be so easy to lose that. So thank you. Thank you so much because you've really kept me going during these weeks. Now I'm excited about this week's topic because we're diving into the topic of emotional intelligence. I mean, talk about something that is fundamental to our life experience and fundamental and core to psychological strength. Our ability to know our own emotions and recognize those of others is absolutely crucial in terms of the way that we relate to other people and experience life. So this week we're talking to a man by the name of Dan Hill. He is an internationally recognized expert on the role of emotions in a bunch of different realms, stuff like politics, business, sports, pop culture. He's a speaker. He's spoken to audiences in over 25 countries. We actually get into that a little bit, the differences in the ways that we express and that we can read emotions in different cultures. It's so interesting. And he basically pioneered the use of something that he calls facial coding, which is the analysis of facial expressions. He pioneered this use in things like market research, which is what he did with his company, Sensory Logic. Um, he's done work for a ton of the world's top 100 companies. He's got seven different patents that are related to facial coding. And he's also the author of the book, Famous Faces Decoded, a guidebook for reading others. This conversation is so interesting. Not only does Dan talk about at a conceptual level, what EQ is and what facial coding is and what emotions are and all of that, but he gives really specific examples of people, like famous people that you know, and how their signature emotions are ones that you can see in the way that they, I mean, frankly, move their face while they talk. He talks about how each of us has our own signature emotion and what that might say about us and also how that connects to societally, the environment that we grew up in, and also our past history. It's so interesting. It was really cool also to talk to Dan about 
specificity in the way that we label emotions. You know, one of the things that we've focused on within Peak Mind is being able to recognize not just I feel good, I feel bad, but to get deeper than that and be more specific about how you label your emotions, because ultimately they are information to you about the situation you're in or about whatever it is you're experiencing. So using those emotions as information, you can't do that as effectively, or you lose some of the good information that they're trying to convey if you use broad language to describe them. So Dan goes into the nuance of, I think it's something like seven different types of anger that we can feel and how they look on people's faces and the different information that they convey. And that's just one example. He goes into many others in this interview. It was so fascinating. And I literally was making the faces that he was describing while we were talking because I couldn't help myself. I was like, is he right? Yes, this is what my face looks like when I express contempt or, you know, when I am feeling skeptical or whatever other emotions that we were talking about at the moment. So I hope you are just as fascinated as I was about this information. And I hope you can think about how you might be able to use it to be more empathetic toward other people and also build deeper connections with other people as you're communicating by both understanding your own emotions at a deeper level and also reading them and the situation that they might be experiencing. So without further ado, I'm really excited to play for you my conversation with Dan Hill. Dan, I'm so excited to have you here for this episode of the podcast because your background is in an area that is so critical to so many facets of life. So this is going to be really fun. Well, thank you. Looking forward to it. So I just want to dive right in. You have a lot of expertise in the realm of EQ or emotional intelligence. Tell us a little bit about the work that you do, about your background, like how you got into this, even though, I mean, it's fascinating. So of course, but um, a little bit about how you specifically view this work and how you got into it. Sure. In 1998, someone I knew at IBM sent over an article about the breakthroughs in brain science and how much we are intuitive, emotional decision makers. Probably the killer statistic that the conservative estimation is that 95% of our mental activity isn't fully conscious. And I just found that so interesting. Like This is the intellectual gold rush of our era, this opportunity to learn better who we are as human beings and how central our emotions are. So I read the article. My hands were trembling. Within five minutes, I decided to start a company to try to revolutionize business, uh, but it applies to everything in life beyond business, and to really delve into emotions. And there's a tool called facial coding that I'm sure I'll be explaining that really allows me to get a better grasp on the emotions people are feeling. I love that. And I love that you started off by talking about um, a statistic that really does blow people's minds when they think about, um, we. I mean, we all feel like we're pretty, I don't know even what word to say here. We're pretty logical. We're pretty with it. We know what's happening with us, right? We're pretty self-aware. But when you think about all the cognitive processes that happen under the surface, if, if it was a glacier, right, it would be under the surface of the water. It's stuff that you can't readily see or have access to, it's incredible how much processing happens that we just don't have any idea is even happening. I love oh, absolutely, Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the biggest lies in life are the ones we tell ourselves. And one of those lies is typically, well, I'm a really rational decision maker. Everyone else in this discussion or this meeting is crazy, uh, but I'm not. But of course, we're all pulled by the force of emotions. It's how the brain is organized. I mean, it came in stages, uh, sensory, emotional, and then rational. But the emotional part of the brain got first mover advantage over the rational and the wiring of the brain is such that we feel a lot more than we think, even though we think we think a lot. I love that. That's totally true. Okay, so now you've probably piqued everybody's interest about um, specifically the work you do around. Tell me what. Uh, tell me what is called again. Facial coding. Facial coding. Uh, it originated with Charles Darwin. He was the first scientist to take emotions seriously. He figured if they didn't matter to us, they would have been weaned out of us over the course of evolution. So emotions matter. Then Darwin says to himself, basically, well, where do we best show and register our emotions? Well, it turns out to be the face. Uh, we have more facial muscles than any other species on the planet. It's the only place in the body where the muscles attach right to the skin. 
So it gives us quick, real-time information about how the other party is feeling in a conversation, for instance. And it's universal. Even a person born blind emotes the same way as you or I. So I had that original aha moment when I read that Cornell University article about the breakthroughs in brain science. But the second one was, I, was when I came across Charles Darwin's work about the face. I, I just was so amazed by it and so delighted uh, because part of my background was as uh, an art historian and uh, I'm very visually oriented. And I said to myself, well, this is cool. I, I think I could actually do this part. Uh, I can follow this. Amazing. Can you give us an example? Like I, I, I totally jive with you along the lines of um, our emotions being so innate and that that part of our brain being so early to evolve and also early to develop in our lives, right? Like babies emote versus, you know, you contrast that with like the newer front part, more modern part of our brain, you know, prefrontal cortex, like that's not developed till we're in our 20s or so. But these are this is like ready to go out of the gate. This is innate, useful, um, just core to how our mind operates. Can you give us some examples of some of the maybe a couple details of facial coding? Like um, maybe I don't even know what they're called, like markers of when somebody might be feeling a specific emotion, what we would expect to see on somebody's face? Oh, absolutely. So there are 23 different expressions and there are seven emotions. And let me just give you a couple, three real quickly. One is when people smirk. That means the corner of the mouth is going to lift up and out, but there's a tension to it. And so you get almost what I call like a pocket tornado. So it looks a bit like a smile. It can overlap with a smile, but it really means something very different. I don't trust you. I don't respect you. I find you beneath me. Contempt is the most reliable indicator that a marriage will fail because you no longer held, hold the other party in esteem. So it looks like a smile, but boy, it, it really packs a toxic punch. Uh, another expression to look out for, when someone is angry, there's a real possibility that their lips will press together, but not just kind of pressed together, but pressed together hard enough that you get a bulge below the middle of the lower lip. That is a really good indicator that someone's getting a bit steamed. And if you're in a conversation, you're trying to win the other party over, uh, you probably just antagonize them. And now they're going to be stubborn enough that winning the conversation or arriving at a compromise is going to be harder than it was you know, a moment ago before you perhaps elicited, triggered this response in the other person. So interesting. And okay, so you're kind of hitting on a couple of perspectives and I'm wondering if we can explore. There's the perspective of how useful emotional intelligence and facial coding is and just this whole body of knowledge that you have. There's utility in us using that as a way to understand ourselves, right? As a way to um, understand and deconstruct the emotion that we're feeling. So I can imagine that there's a ton of utility there, and I'd love to start with that. But I'd also love for us to get into what this means for our relationships with other people, because um, there's so much that comes in play into play with the way that we communicate and the way that we interact with um, other people. So maybe just starting with what this means for us understanding ourselves. I know you've got some really great insight into the role that emotion and EQ plays for us, like core for ourselves. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. George Orwell has a funny quote. He says, by the age of 50, a man has the face he deserves. Mm. Uh, we have muscle memory. We have repeated patterns. We are habitual creatures after all. So you can kind of play a mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of, the, of us all sort of game if you want. People do have signature expressions. So just the other day, it was Audrey Hepburn's birthday. And so uh, I posted a little something on my blog faces of the week regarding that. And Audrey Hepburn tended to show happiness, but a fairly muted happiness. And the other emotion was fear. Uh, her eyebrows tended to go up. Uh, her eyes went wider. Fear in many ways, which is very related to surprise, means you're trying to take in information about the world around you uh, because there's a danger lurking there and you're trying to get more information so you have the opportunity to make your adjustments. 
Well, in Audrey's life, uh, that fear came in part because uh, her mother was not a very uh, benevolent you know, figure in her life, a pretty tough mom, uh, pretty distant relationship, uh, wasn't so well treated. Uh, Audrey also had a point where they left London and they went back to Holland because Audrey's mother was a Nazi sympathizer. And uh, Audrey lived through the last year of World War II in Holland, like much of the population, very nearly starving to death. So her famous thin physique uh, comes out of that starvation moment or starvation months, as it were. So people do have a signature expression and you can look for the triggers and the meaning of that emotion. And it's a pretty good indicator of who somebody is. And uh, I use it in every conversation to kind of get a bead and understanding of who I'm talking about. And it may be an in the moment response, but so often there is a pattern that becomes evident uh, sooner than later. That's amazing. I didn't know all of that about Audrey Hepburn, actually. I didn't realize that that was her that was her life experience. It, it was. And I did not know either until I was writing my book, Famous Faces Dakota. I just thought of her this wonderful kind of creature in Roman Holiday and Breakfast at Tiffany's and so forth. Uh, but she had a very difficult uh, upbringing. So when we think, I mean, think about that, right? Each of us has had our own. This is something that I'm really passionate about, just the way that, um, you know, you mentioned that 95 percent of the of the cognition that we have that's sort of subconscious or involuntary or outside of our awareness, you know, that a large part of that develops because, you know, as we, when we're born and as we grow up, we've got this part of our mind that is like a wide open set of doors. It's just there to learn. It's literally there to just take in information and there's not much of a filter there. So it's not, the front of your brain, again, to make a distinction saying, oh, I don't think that that's right. That message that I just got from my parents or this this thing that I saw on TV. I don't I don't agree with that. It's literally just wide open, accepting the information that comes in, hoping that stuff that happens more often is more true than stuff that happens less often or it's more important than stuff that happens less often. Hopefully everything will get sorted out in the wash. But that doesn't necessarily happen. Our life experience individually as people it shapes so much the what i like to call like mental habits or the habitual thought processes that we have that guide our behavior i can imagine though that that influences what you would call somebody's signature emotion or emotions like the way the the life experience that you had would potentially dictate where you gravitate on that emotional scale is that the case it is. I mean, I'll give you another Hollywood example. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, he was perfect to play the guy in Casablanca who doesn't get the girl and goes on to a kind of a lonely existence. His signature expression is his inner eyebrows pull together and arch up. That is a sign of surprise and fear, but it's also a sign of sadness. And I think there's that real mark of sadness on him. And that's why he can play those kinds of characters effectively. Just like Hepburn in his case, uh, he did not have very close relations with his parents. They were very formal kind of Victorian types. They did not think that uh, being intimate or giving appreciation or affection to your kids uh, was worthwhile, that you should be above that, you didn't need that. And it gives me cause to bring in one other kind of inspiration when I made this shift into facial coding. It was a work of John Balby talking about the attachment theory and that, mm. you know, your relationship with that primary other, often the mother, are you, you know, attached? Are you anxiously attached? Are you more the avoidant type? I would say Humphrey Bogart ended up being more the avoidant type because of what happened. And those early years, to your point, are so important because they are forming us whether we know it or not. And so one of my favorite comments that people have made is that as a parent, you can work really hard the first two years or you can work really hard the next 20 years. The choice is yours. Mm. This is so interesting because it's this is this is one of the things that I love about psychology. Like you can talk about a topic. <clears throat> you can talk about a topic on its own, right? Like we can talk about emotional intelligence or we can talk about the subconscious mind or we could talk about attachment theory. But in reality, there's such an interweaving among all of these topics that you start to see how interconnected everything is. Um, 
I've actually talked on the podcast and prior episodes about attachment theory and specifically around, um, you know, my own situation. I lost my dad to cancer when I was really young. And to me that the way that I've kind of come to understand this is that I think I learned that people who you love, who are really close to you, they go away. And so I definitely battled with that, you know, anxious avoidant attachment style for a long time. And it was something that I had to figure out and learn about myself and learn about what it might mean and then start to see which behaviors were in alignment with it that were potentially causing problems in the relationships that I was having. So I want to just say that because I want to draw a connection to something that we've talked about in the past on the podcast, but also to say, now I'm so curious what my own signature emotions are. Is there a way for people to figure this out about themselves aside from like getting on the phone with you and having you like diagnose the wrinkles on my face? (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, you know, a significant other can certainly st- step in and play this role. I mean, in my book, Famous Faces Decoded, I really try to offer up the secret sauce. So I go through each of the 23 expressions and which emotion or potentially which emotions it shows. And I use the celebrity examples because we know these people or think we know them and uh, we can relate to them. So it's just an easier, more fun way in. But everyone can do this. I never reveal what my wife's signature expression is. But the very first time I met her at the tennis club, uh, I saw a certain combination of of facial expressions that don't always go together. And it's very definitely her signature expression. She probably makes this particular uh, look on her face, I would say, in a conversation, no less than two or three times every two minutes. What? Yes. That is amazing to me. That is incredible. I need to like (laughs) stare at myself talking or something. (laughs) I'm so curious. Okay, I love this. I love this. Um, I want to turn now to what this means for our, say, relationships, but also it's broader than that. It's interactions with other people, the way that this might help us um, do a better job of communicating and understanding and empathizing with other people, because I can imagine that there's a huge connection to Uh, the degree to which we can empathize with another people, with another person when we're communicating with them, if we can sort of read the expression on their face or understand it to a deeper level. Yeah, no, a lot of the EQ literature is talking about being a good listener, you know, practicing empathy. So listening is great, but if you've never been lied to in life, congratulations. And I already said earlier, people lie to themselves. So the words are, are wonderful. But sometimes people don't say everything that's on their mind. Sometimes they're not as articulate as they might be. Sometimes they don't actually realize how they're feeling or what the important clues are. So in ambiguous situations, the literature suggests that about 55% of the true communication is coming from the face. So yes, it can be in a relationship. It could be in a nascent relationship where you're on a first or second date. Uh, It could be office mates at work. It could be your own children, just among friends, uh, people you you know play tennis with. There are so many ways in which this can apply, but it gives you the opportunity to know the patterns over time, which is that signature expressions, but also the in the moment, how are they feeling? Maybe there's something in your interaction. You you just floated an idea to do something, and they said, "Sure, let's do that," but actually their face might have said, eh, "I'm not so sure. I'm on board with that." It's helpful to pick these things up. Uh, another cl- cliche or quote that I love is from uh, Sherlock Holmes, who says to Watson, Watson, you have an instinctive grasp of the obvious. Uh, we are, are more Sherlock Holmes, or less Sherlock Holmes and more Watson than we'd like to imagine. So the chance to be more acute about picking up these signals, I believe, really can make a difference in people's lives. Are there people who are easier and harder to read? Does that make sense? Are there people who emote more obviously? Is that even a question that makes sense? I can imagine, you know, that that's the case. Oh, no, it's a good question. And it's true. I mean, your emotions tend to turn on uh, when you care about something, uh, when you're emotionally engaged. I mean, in fact, if you go back to Latin, movere uh, is the root word for verb for both uh, emotion and motivation. 
So there's a lot of connection there in terms of you, you care, you're feeling about something, it matters to you, and your face will show that caring. So that's why when you go on a date or if you're married to someone that you say is, you know, like talking to a brick wall, what you're indicating is that you're not seeing any tangible signals that someone uh, really cares about the conversation you're having. So yes, I have certainly coded over all of these years because I've in fact done market research for more than half the uh, top 100 advertisers in the world. So I have traveled and spoken in more than 20 countries. I've, tr I've gone to another 40 just on my own for leisure. Uh, certainly the Japanese are the toughest as a culture to pick up. It's a very crowded island. Uh, they tend to be very formal. They were influenced by the British who were kind of the height of their power when when Japan was forming its kind of national contemporary psyche. So in Japan, there's a really important term of art in a facial coding realm. It's the micro expression. The fact that someone in as little as one sixth of a second may show an expression on their face before they, before they try to squelch it or suppress it or go to a poker face. Uh, for instance, the, the Chinese are much easier to read than the Japanese. So there are individuals who may not emote a lot, there are individuals, on the other hand, that I sometimes say they're not like an open book. They're like an open trilogy because there is so much emoting going on. Sean Penn would be an example of that. Any movie that I watch with Sean Penn is like a real workout because the guy emotes constantly. And as a facial coder, I'm, I'm very sensitive and alert to that. Is it just exhausting to be you and like have conversations with people? <laughs> Uh, it's mostly fascinating and fun because you read the newspaper differently. Uh, I remember when the Iraq war was going on before the surge and at 1.2 generals were testifying to Congress and they were saying it was all going well. And I looked at their face and I turned to my wife and I said, no, no, this is not going well whatsoever. So uh, it can be a movie, a TV show. Uh, I love watching The Office. Uh, because Steve Carell has all these great things going on with his mm. eyebrows all the time. Uh, you can be at a party and you see somebody with a certain look across the room. And you're like, huh, what, what caused that expression? What's going on? So I find it fascinating. But yes, I could see that for some people, it might be a bit overwhelming at times. <laughs> Are there features or some of these markers that you've talked about? Are there ones that instantly sort of make you feel like you shouldn't trust a person or, and on the flip side, ones that make you feel like, okay, this person's probably okay. Because I, I have this hypothesis that that sort of tingling behind your neck that you get about certain people, like, I just don't feel like, I don't, I can't point my, put my finger on it, but I don't think that this is okay. I don't know. I think we take in this very subtle information. Um, and most of us, I, I'm definitely one of those people have not thought through what might have led to that, you know, knee jerk reaction that I had. But I can imagine that some of these subtle facial expressions might be some of that information we're taking in. So are there ones that sort of you tend to lean in the direction of trusting versus not trusting someone? Yeah, the most important thing is the rhythm of the expression, because the way in which people emote is kind of like a wave breaking on a shore. It gathers at its peak and then it lets go. So if it's a natural expression, first of all, the timing should be such that the expression could be a micro expression, uh, but it's more likely to last one to three, maybe four seconds. If someone laughs at your joke for more than four seconds, they're probably brown nosing you, mm. quite honestly. So the expression, the rhythm, the things I look for is, does it come on naturally or is it kind of like a flash bulb that comes on too abruptly? Does it linger for too long? Does it go away too quickly? I call that the guillotine smile when it just kind of drops off someone's face as if they've deployed the smile and now they're kind of you know putting it back in their pocket or taking it away from the, the scene. So really you want to look for that. You can also look for whether or not the smile, for instance, uh, comes on the face in kind of a lopsided manner, uh, stronger on one side than the other. That could be an indication that they're kind of forcing the expression. So I remember some years ago, I went on a non-hunting safari in Botswana. You know, animals camouflage all the time. It's part of survival. I would say in human beings, the things that I notice is that they can be very expressive and they go deadpan on me. And I'm like, huh, why is that? What are you trying to hide? Or the expression that doesn't seem natural 
or the smile in particular that does not seem natural. Those would be the first three places I would go to. Mm-hmm. Totally get it. And I love too, just to just to kind of go back, the connection that you talked about between the way that we m- maybe just allow ourselves to emote versus maybe culturally and societally, the degree to which we um, have been trained to, I guess, hide those emotions. There's a lot of, I mean, a lot of the work that I did in graduate school looked at things like like social constructs, like things like gender, where um, we are more, uh, we think it's more okay for men to express anger but not things like sadness, whereas women can express something like sadness and have it be socially acceptable, but not express anger as openly. Do you see that show up when you you know, watch both men and women speak? Like when you're looking for these uh, markers with men and women, do you see a difference there just that could be based on just societal kind of norms for gender? Oh, I, I absolutely pay attention to that. I think one of the reasons I'm a facial coder among many is that uh, my father tended to show smirks and was a bit condescending to my mother and also to myself at times, and I did not like it. Uh, it's probably not the average high school boy who reads The Second Sex by Simone Beauvoir on, <laughs> on his own, uh, but I did that. So I am a lifelong advocate for the importance of women getting their full due. And I can't tell you how many times in a corporate setting, for instance, after a speech or a project, I will have a woman come up to me and say, I'm so glad that, and it's a sad statement about our society, I'm so glad that a, a guy would bring this forward and and champion the role of emotions, the importance of emotions, because unfortunately, if I or another woman here brought it forward, it might be looked at more scants, you know, by the people in power who might tend to be a guy, for instance. So yes, uh, emotions matter. Yes, it's not just women who feel emotions. It's guys who feel emotions. Yes, they drive our reactions. And yes, I see different patterns. So you've hit on a really key one uh, about who can be allowed in a manner of speaking to go to a certain emotion. Uh, and when I did my book, Famous Faces Decoded, Happiness is the only emotion where women, as a rule, through the 173 celebrities, showed more happiness than the guys. Otherwise, Mm. it was always the guys who showed more. Because I think women still unfairly are somewhat judged on, you know, beauty as well as, you know, are you a nice person? Are you pleasant, charming, Mm -hmm. easy to be around? And I think that puts a certain pressure or obligation on women at times. In contrast, the emotion where the guys really stood out, yeah, they certainly felt more anger, uh, but it was contempt. They showed twice as much contempt as the women did uh, in my study. That's amazing. And something something subtle in the way that you're describing this that I don't want people to miss is how specific you're being about words, right? It's not anger, it's contempt. And This is something that we talk about a lot in when we do workshops in this domain in peak mind, because we tend to just uh, we tend to get kind of heuristical about how we're feeling. I'm feeling good or I'm feeling bad uh, is probably the highest hierarchy that we have. But, you know, one step down from that is maybe we would say angry or sad or something to so be a little more specific than bad, but you're going even more specific than that. And the more you can get, more specific you can get about labeling your emotion, the better chance you have of understanding where it might have come from, what you can do to impact it or whether you need to, what that emotion, what information that emotion is trying to convey to you about the situation that you're in. But if you're using these really nonspecific words, you miss out on the information that that emotion is trying to convey. So I just thought it was really cool how specific you were being about the way you were labeling these emotions that you were looking for. Well, thank you, because that really is central to getting the maximum value out of facial coding. Uh, For instance, in happiness, I don't just say happy. I have four different levels of happiness I'm looking at. With a true smile or joy, the muscle around the eye tightens. It's why you get the twinkle in the eye and it can't be faked. Um, So that's the highest level. 
If you come down a level, it's just a broad smile in the cheeks. That's what I call pleasure. Uh, then you have the social smile, the kind of more modest smile uh, that plays on both cheeks. And finally, I call it acceptance. It's kind of like the Filene's ba bargain basement of happiness. <laughs> and that's where just one corner, one side of the mouth will turn upward in a smile. And often the duration can be quite brief. And each of those have a different implication as to how the person is feeling. And even I go deeper in my book because I discovered, I didn't expect this, but it was one of those discoveries where if I take those top two levels, joy and pleasure, I found a lot of instances where you had fairly unstable people who tended to go to one or the other, but not both equally. So they, I called it tilt, that there was something almost unbalanced about them. And two, I'll, I'll move from Hollywood finally and go on to uh, music. Two people who showed that tilt tendency where they either went high in joy, but not at all high on pleasure or vice versa, were John Lennon and Whitney Houston. And both of them were, you know, pretty unstable people. And so there's a lot of mileage you can get from this. And even if you go on to another emotion, anger, there are nine different ways we show anger on the face. So some of those I would call much more in the realm of confusion, like when the eyebrows knit together. Uh, other times it can be outrage, like when the mouth opens in kind of a horizontal funnel, almost like a dog where you've taken its bone away from you. So to say someone is angry, you know, again, is, is painting too simple a picture. You know, what's the nuance? What's the flavor of the anger going on? Is it a confusion, annoyance, frustration, outrage? Those are, to me, richer words to help paint the picture of what's happening for somebody. This is so good. I'm literally, I'm over here, like making the faces that you're saying. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's anybody listening who's in their car or like running around their kitchen making these faces. <laughs> I feel myself totally doing that. Um, I love this because it's hitting on such an important aspect of psychological strength. Like our, we talk about things like um, basic things like thoughts and emotions and behaviors as sort of like big categories that roll up into this psychological experience that we have. And this is such an important key aspect of it. I'm curious about, given your background in this work, how you would define psychological strength, just given that this is such a big component of it. Well, I think it's a matter of resiliency and being able to bounce back from a situation. You might be able to bounce back higher. You might bounce back differently. Uh, and there's no problem with slowing down for a bit. I think sometimes people think that there's this stigma about sadness. Sadness is what I call in my book a rear view mirror sort of emotion. It gives you a chance to slow down, reflect, understand what went wrong. So, you know, some of that is actually entirely appropriate and helpful. On the other hand, yes, wallowing in it would not be, you know, strength and resiliency. Um, so it's all in good measure. There is no good emotion. There is no bad emotion. It's just what information does it give you? How do you use it? And for that matter, what's the blend at times? Because, of course, we feel often more than one emotion at the same time. I'm so glad you said that because uh, there, this is one of those times when there's a distinction between, you know, what somebody who has spent time in, you know, a credible corner of the field uh, what they would say based on what research and data shows us versus what somebody might put in their Instagram meme um, around, you can't feel gratitude and anger at the same time. No, you really can. <laughs> you can have a whole mixed up set of emotions. That's why it makes this so difficult to wade through at times. Um, so I'm just really glad that you made that distinction. Um, I want to read your book now. I haven't read it, and I'm like <laughs> morbidly curious now. Um, can you give us the title of your book again? Tell us again where we can find you if we want more information about this, because I'm officially fascinated. Uh, of course. The, the book is called Famous Faces Decoded, and the subtitle, A Guidebook for Reading Others. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it via my website, which is the obligatory three W's and then sensorylogic.com, like your five senses, because you'll find not only that book there, but I've published seven others as well uh, with applications for EQ for everything from business to politics to a book about people's intuitive reactions to famous art. Amazing. This has been so 
interesting. Um, I don't think I'm going to approach conversations that I have with people today in the same way that I did before. I'm going to be looking for these things now, which I think is just awesome. Um, I really appreciate you being here and I appreciate you sharing your background and um, your expertise in a way that is easy to understand. It's not so, even though it comes from an academic place, it's not so academic that we can't track with you and follow with you. So thanks so much for being here and for sharing this so openly with us. Oh, absolutely, April. I had a a great time. Thank you. It's a simple fact that nearly everyone in the world could benefit from building psychological strength, but not everyone will put in the time and effort to do so. But today you did. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Building Psychological Strength. Now, if you're interested in building the mental toughness, confidence, and resilience you need to thrive through life's ups and downs, visit us at www.peakmindpsychology.com. Also, if there's someone in your life who could benefit from this episode, please share it with them. And if you yourself found this episode valuable, meaning if you took away even one insight that you can use to build psychological strength in your own life, we would so appreciate it if you would drop us a rating and a review on iTunes. The thing is, the more ratings and reviews we have, the easier it is to get this powerful and important content out to the people who need to hear it. Remember, your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. So choose wisely, my friend, and I'll see you next time on Building Psychological Strength.